Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Tuesday, the 28th of November, 2023. Good as always to have you on board, everybody. Today's show is brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield. What makes good vision coverage? I knew it when I saw it. Things like fully covered vision care exams for all members, access to over 125,000 independent providers and national retailers. That's why I chose Blue Cross Blue Shield FEP Vision. See what we can do for you at bcbsfepvision.com. Now, before I introduce my guest, I have two quick announcements. The first is that the December issue of Proceedings will be out this week. It is the kickoff of phase three of the American Sea Power Project, which is focused on the means of strategy in the ends, ways, means continuum. Uh, It starts with a very challenging China-Taiwan wartime scenario, which is set in 2026, followed by articles by warfare domain experts. We asked them to describe how they would tackle the scenario in their particular areas of expertise. So surface warfare, strike warfare, submarines, mine warfare, C2, et cetera. More articles will follow in the January issue. So look for that issue of proceedings. It will be posted online on uh, the 30th, November 30th, this Thursday uh, in the uh, late afternoon. Uh, The second announcement is that our annual Defense Forum Washington will be at the Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. on Thursday, 7 December. We have a great mix, as we always do, of congressional, military, and DOD speakers lined up to talk about maritime, naval, global security issues. To learn more and to register, go to usni.org forward slash events. You won't want to miss it. Uh, Now for my guest. Joining me from his home on the eastern shore of Virginia is novelist David Poyer. His latest book in the Dan Lenson series of novels is titled The Academy. It is published by St. Martin's Press and it will be released. I just have a, a review copy. It will be released in the coming weeks. David, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Bill. Glad to be here. I I really should say welcome back to the show. You were our guest in November 2018, so about exactly five years ago for episode 50. So at that time, we were doing audio only. So people who want to go back and find that episode, you can just Google Proceedings Podcast David Poyer. It'll pop right up. Uh, When you were on then, we talked about another Dan Lenson novel, which was called Deep War, which was about war between China and Taiwan. So I was thinking about the coincidence there of the uh, the launch of the American Sea Power Project Phase Three and our scenario that's in the December issue, uh, and your series of articles, which I thought were really well done on that potential uh, for war in the Western Pacific and how it might play out. And so, um, and, and it's it's great to have you back on the show and to to, to talk to you about your latest uh, novel in the series. Well, to uh, the uh, the funny thing about uh, the uh, War with China series that I did, Bill, is that 10 years ago, I kind of pitched that idea around and tried to gin up some interest in people coming in with me on the land warfare and air warfare side to do a series of novels around that scenario. And the, uh, the answer I got back uh, was pretty much, uh, oh, we're friends with them. It's never going to happen. You know, this is totally unrealistic. All right, 10 years down the road from there, uh, I've done six novels in the series, and as you pointed out, uh, kind of uh, had to cover had to cover the air and ground warfare uh, aspects myself. And, uh, you know, to judge by the reviews, I, I didn't do too badly, although certainly the Navy portions are, I think, better. Yeah, so uh, a couple of those novels, if, if I've got them right, and I've read all the ones about the China scenario, the tipping point, then onslaught, then hunter killer, then deep war, then overthrow, and then violent peace. I think those were all the China scenario ones, right? Yeah, we took it all the way from the opening of the war through the uh, the dark days of the war, through coming back, island hopping, Marine Corps um, action in Western China, uh, action in Hainan, and then the aftermath of the nuclear strike. Yeah, and and uh, I'm a huge fan of uh, of Ghost Fleet by uh, August uh, Cole and uh, Peter Singer, and I'm just as huge a fan of your series of this, particularly those five or six books on the China Taiwan scenario. I think they do just 
really well done. And as somebody who has been following the Chinese Navy now for about 15, 16 years very closely, um, I can tell you that the, your, the, the research that you did uh, had to be very extensive to get them as, as well and as accurate as you did. You did, a, I, I think, a terrific job. And I've That's talked to other people who were in the naval intelligence business and still are and follow China, and, and they also think that it, it's a terrific, a really well done series of novels. Wow. High really. praise. Thank you. Um, so for our listeners who haven't yet met Dan Lenson, your main character in this series, and what have you got? Like twenty-two books, I think twenty twenty-two books of in in that series. Who, who's Dan Lenson? Uh, Lenson is a uh, Naval Academy graduate, surface line officer who uh, gradually, over a very star-crossed career, fleets up through command, and then uh, to in this latest book, uh, he returns to the vice admiral level. He was brief, briefly a vice admiral during the war, but. That was a wartime commission, of course, and he reverted to 06 and, uh, and then is fleeted up again um, uh, to a vice admiral to fill the uh, Naval Academy billet, which is currently um, currently um, vacant because um, because we can't promote anybody to vice admiral, apparently. Uh, but let's not get into the politics of that. Yeah. And uh, David, you also are a Naval Academy graduate, also a surface line officer. Uh, you retired as a Navy Reserve Captain. I'm curious: Are there autobiographical aspects of Dan Lenson uh, in in the books? Is is well, there David Poyer in in Dan Lenson? Yeah, certainly, uh, certainly. You know, like all novelists, uh, I drew on my personal experiences, especially for the early books. Uh, the Circle was the one that uh, came out uh, second, I think, and that was. Uh, that drew on my experiences as an ensign in frigates where our mission was to go north of the Arctic Circle uh, in the wintertime, uh, find the biggest storm we could find and stay in it for as long as we could survive. That was the mission. And believe me, it didn't take a great deal of uh, imagination to turn that into a, a, a novel. So the idea was to test a new VDS sonar. Uh, we had to test it under the worst conditions to, you know, see if the thing would work in heavy sea states and freezing temperatures and uh, night and day. And so, yes, yeah, so, so that uh, that drew from that experience. Um, the Some of the others did as well. Tomahawk, uh, which was about the development of the Tomahawk missile, drew from my experience um, uh, in the early years of the program, helping develop what we called a flying torpedo in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I was with, the, I was with uh, um, the, the Joint Cruise Missile Program. Um, I was not part of the program, but I was working with them with an independent contractor and uh, got to see some of the infighting and some of the resistance to the whole idea of a Tomahawk missile. And, of course, now the Tomahawk is an integral part of every, practically every mission that we can contemplate, but there was a lot of resistance to it at the time. So yeah, that one draws from my personal experience. Some of the others do as well. And some of them, you know, as the series goes on, I have to depend more on interviews with people. Uh, I have to depend on research uh, and I have to depend uh, at least a little bit in the imagination and, and sure. some historical parallels, for example, uh, in the uh, War with China series, the whole action in Western China and Xinjiang is kind of um, kind of drawn from historical parallels, and even the end of uh, Teddy Oberg, our my SEAL Master Chief, who raises a uh, Islamicist rebellion in Western China, uh, even the end of that kind of has a little Easter egg to Joseph Conrad. Gotcha. So uh, minor spoiler, minor spoiler alert here. Uh, but we'll try not to give away too much of this book. So in in um, the academy, Lenson, as you said, is now vice admiral. He's just taken over as the superintendent of the naval academy. He has to tackle several challenges that face the naval academy itself. Can you can you describe uh, a couple of those for us? Well, yes. Yeah. So this is in the aftermath of the war. And of course, in the aftermath of every war, we have to save money, right? We have to 
you know, cut back the armed services. There's no more threat. You know, we don't think about the future. Uh, we just need to claw that money back. So, so, um, so there's definitely a downsizing going on. That's his number one challenge is reduced funding. The number two challenge, of course, is politics because there are people both from the left and the right who are trying to change the Naval Academy. Some of them have some logic on their side. Others do not. Um, and Dan has to sort of pick and choose his way down the channel. You know, well, he's got, you know, people shouting from this side and people shouting from this side and political maneuvering. And uh, and uh, so that's a challenge for him. Um, you know, kind of a dual mission there to act for the best interests of the Naval Academy, to act for the best interests of the mid, the mids, and to act for the best interests of the country. And one thing that Dan tries very hard not to do is act for his own best interests. So let's see, what other challenges are there? There's definitely the one about, uh, you know, subsidence of the yard, rising sea levels, um, storms. Uh, that's another which is, uh, has particular impact on the Naval Academy of the service academies because it's the smallest and it's also the lowest, the closest to sea level. West Point has a lot of a lot of excess acreage. The Air Force Academy has huge amounts of excess acreage, uh, and they're higher on higher ground. Uh, Coast Guard shares some of the same problems, and Merchant Marine shares some of the same problems, but not to the same extent the Naval Academy does. So that was something he is going to have to deal with. So those are, I think, three of the challenges, and how he addresses them are he's going to have to hit the ground running uh, as well as to deal with some staff issues and uh, changes that he wants to bring about at the academy. So um, I think at one point he says something like, I thought this was supposed to be my twilight tour and it was going to be a sinecure and an easy job and it turns out to be nothing but. But of course, if it was an easy job, we wouldn't have a novel, would we? Exactly, exactly. So as an aside, I just wanted to, because it, it, it was so fresh in my mind, and, you know, here at the Naval Institute, we're on the academy yard, we're out on Hospital Point, you know, we look down on some of that reclaimed land on the athletic fields out here on Hospital Point, and uh, we are on that high ground. You mentioned it in the uh, uh, in the novel where there's a, there's a point where Lenson is, uh, I can't remember if, if he's the super, if he's the amid, looking back on it, but he runs up uh, the cemetery hill, which we're on the top of here at the, you know, out here at the Naval Institute on Beach Hall, uh, where we overlook the cemetery, which is the high ground uh, of the academy yard. Um, a year ago, about a year ago now, we had Sarah Phillips, who's the architect of the Naval Academy, come out and brief us on what the Naval Academy's plans are to deal with sea level rise. And that was, uh, you know, it was a fascinating brief. And a lot of that, or, or similar ideas, I guess, that are in your novel uh, were things that she presented about, you know, raising berms and beefing up the seawalls and, you know, pumps and all that kind of stuff. Did you talk to uh, Admiral Buck, the former superintendent, or maybe even to Sarah Phillips about sea level rise and subsidence here at the Academy? I, I did interview uh, Admiral Buck. Uh, I don't think we got into that topic. We were speaking about the challenges of taking over the job and some of the internal issues and, some of the uh, issues of dealing with his superiors and with Congress and so forth. I don't think we got into sea level rise and subsidence in that interview, but but several years ago, I did do an article for Shipmate magazine about, um, I think it was called something like uh, Neptune Will Have His Revenge. And mm -hmm. it was, uh, and it covered, I, I went into fairly great depth, both the geology and the settling issue and the sea level rise issue and several others in depth in that article. And um, so uh, I had already done a lot of background thinking and research about that when it came to time to be writing this book. Yeah, yeah, it was one of the things that I, was interesting. It was it certainly came up in, in our minds on the staff as uh, as Sarah Phillips was talking about, you know, this Naval Academy 2050 plan, which is how they're going to Kind of harden the naval academy for a sea level rise, and uh, you know you you can't be here without understanding that 
you know, we're all what our fate or the Naval Academy's fate is very much intertwined with the city of Annapolis as well, right? And we we abut each other, so you can't you can't save one without the other. So, you know, the Naval Academy has to work with the uh, with the uh, the city and the and the governor's office, and they have to work with the Naval Academy as well because there's so much waterfront property that that runs up against each other. And and some of that was in your in your book too, where Lenson, as the superintendent, is in the midst of a crisis. You know, calling, talking to the mayor, and talking to the governor's office, and and so I, I found that to be, I don't know, depression. I guess is a way to put it. Um, well, I, hope, I hope you enjoyed the linkages between his past and present. Because the book actually occurs in two fi two time frames. There's it does right. Dan is a first class med, and Dan is the superintendent. And there's two different ways of. Certainly, he's looking at the administration differently as a first class med versus being the soup. Uh, so, uh, and and there's two different plot lines, but I think the theme may kind of be the same. But what did you think? Yeah, no, I agree, and and I found it. it that was a that was a, both an interesting and a challenging thing for me as a reader, as it, you're toggling back and forth between current day Superintendent Lenson and long ago Midshipman Lenson. Uh, there were also a lot of flashbacks to other chapters or other books in the series, right? So things that happened during the war, for example, again, spoiler alert, um, but there's, you know, he he has to reckon with charges about when he was commander, commanding officer of a ship in the war with China and an action that he took at sea to uh, prioritize one mission over saving sailors uh, from another Navy uh -huh. uh, that was, you know, on a ship that were sunk. And so there's accusations against him. Um, and he's got to, he's got to reckon with those early in the book. But um, I was curious uh, as I read it, is this the final Lenson book? Because you're doing this back and forth, Midshipman Lenson and Vice Admiral Lenson, and it, it's much, very much in his head for a lot of the of the of the book. Is this the last book in the Dan Lenson series? Well, I think I pretty much telegraphed that in the, in the concluding pages, Bill, uh, when he's standing there taking the review and uh, at the march past and uh, holding the salute and flashing back on the the critical moments in his career, the, both the high points and the low points. So the answer is, uh, as far as I can foresee, that's the coda to the series. And after 22 books, I think it's a natural end. Yeah, that makes sense. I didn't, I didn't know if you had aspirations for, you know, President Lenson or Vice President Lenson in the future or anything like that. Okay, good. No, I um, so uh, one of the things as I was reading this, and I've read now, I think I've read about 10 of the books. I haven't read all 22, but uh, I've read about the last 10 of them. Um, and for the first half, I, I, I didn't like it quite as much as some of the others, and I couldn't put my finger on why. And then I realized that there is less plot. You know, this is not war with China. Um, and there's also fewer other major characters in your other book, you mentioned, you know, master seal, master chief, Teddy Oberg. And he's a, he's a big character in uh, at least th those five books where you're focused on the war with China. Um, and, and, you know, and, and he's not in this book. A lot of those other characters are not, or they're maybe mentioned, but they're not, they're right. not um, front and center in this book. Um, so L Linson is in his own head or the readers in Lenson's head much more. And I was curious, you know, from a writer's perspective, is that harder for you to write? Well, let's see, that's a question of narrative perspective. And I think the, the um, I don't think it's either harder or easier, but it certainly narrows and bottlenecks down what you can show the reader. Um, yeah. When you cover the way Tolstoy covered uh, war and war and peace was with different characters. And that's pretty much what you have to do in terms of a war. So so that was why with the war with China, I branched out to five different characters and they saw the war from five different uh, points of view, including Dan's wife, Blair Titus, who, uh, who was with the administration and had, had inputs in the overall strategic direction of the war which, of course, Oberg saw nothing of, and Dan saw a little bit of, but not a lot. And uh, Aisha Rahim saw practically nothing of it. Uh, so um, 
So that was why I had to resort to what I call a braided narrative, multiple yeah, yeah. Inter occasionally intersecting uh, character arcs with uh, with the Academy. And also, you'll note with uh, with The Circle, the earliest book, it's a single character arc, a single point of view character, and uh, a very tight uh, a very tight point of view. Um, are they easier? Are they? I think I think I enjoy switching points of view because it kind of exercises your muscles a little bit more. Um, but I wouldn't say it's easier or harder. Um, Got it. I don't want to go too deep in the weeds on, you know, on fictional technique here. <laughs> You'll get me into my lecture mode, and that's not where I want to be. Well, you you teach writing, right? You've, you're a guest lecturer, and you you've taught writing for much of your career as well. Uh, was, just was, you know, talk yeah. about that for a minute. Well, I was with uh, I was with uh, with Welch University Creative Writing Program for 16 years. Um, and currently I'm with the Osabaugh Writers Retreat, and I'm on the board of the Northern Appalachia Review, uh, and gradually tapering off on, um, on things like that. Uh, still, still doing a bit of writing, uh, still not really doing in, just doing a little bit of, um, you know, symposia and online teaching and that sort of thing, but kind of easing off on that as well, Bill. Cool. Um, so some of Lenson's personal feelings about the Naval Academy resonated with me. I'm your class of 71. I'm class of 87. Uh, and and to, I think you you sort of elided over uh, the, you know, what class, you know, when he graduated. It's a little hard to tell, you know, some of the some of the landmarks in the book, like you mentioned Isherwood Hall, which was there when you were there. But by the time I was at the Naval Academy was gone. Right. And so I was thinking, well, I, I would have, I guess I was thinking that maybe Lenson was about my year group some somewhere in the mid 80s, but perhaps he's older than that. And, uh, you know, there are a few things that, you know, it's a little hard for me to tell, like exactly when he graduated and, you know, whether there were women or was it before there were women, there, you know, were women when he was a midshipman. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I think you were uh, a little bit. Uh, I'm guessing you were, uh, you know, inexact about that on purpose, right? You sort of yeah, brushed I, over some of those uh, details. Well, I tried to tried to design that or set it in a kind of generic past. Yeah. It's, it's not a specific year, as you noted, and I've never given Dan a specific year. Um, so, um, because I didn't really want to, I mean, I think that, uh, yeah. I mean, what's the point of doing that? It really limits you. And uh, and I kind of like uh, things like the generic future or the generic present or the generic past, and and you give the reader enough clues that the reader can sort of uh, sort of understand it, but uh, but uh, you're not specifically located. I don't like to tie myself down that way. The only the only times I actually did that was in the Hemlock County novels, which were firmly set in specific years, and those were not Navy novels at all. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Well, I suppose if uh, if you'd said that he was a class of '85 guy, you know, I wouldn't have liked him as much as I could imagine him '87 or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Good. Uh, good reason. But but there's uh, there's some ambivalence, like you you I sense in Lenson the way he remembers things when he was a midshipman, uh, that that there's a pride in having been, you know, at the Naval Academy, there's a pride in being there, but there's also some, you know, he looks at it uh, both back on it as the superintendent and then also remembers it as a midshipman as, you know, it's not a perfect place. It's not, it's not the, it maybe what outsiders think, oh, wow, you know, this aura of the Naval Academy, right? There's some ambivalence and, and sometimes perhaps some regret that you sense in Lenson. And, and, and that resonated with me. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a graduate with, with similar feelings. Uh, for example, you know, he remembers the death of a plebe when he was a firstie. Um, he remembers that, you know, he made a big personal mistake when he was a midshipman and he doesn't he doesn't look back wistfully on, you know, four years together at the bay. And I'm, I was just kind of curious, you know, uh, why you paint him like that? What, what Does that reflect maybe your memories or thoughts about the academy itself or, 
you know, your interviews with people and how they are your classmates or others might, you know, kind of think about the academy, uh, warts and all, perhaps, I, you know, I, that that part of it really resonated with me. And I was I wanted to get inside your head and just ask why. Well, the um, the academy is an important event in a person's life. And if you look at, you know, how how events in people's lives, watershed events like divorce, for example, like going to war, like boot camp like, I don't know, graduate school maybe, uh, marriage, uh, birth of a child. Uh, these all have emotional resonance and all, not all the resonance is positive. Uh, with the academy, I think uh, almost everyone, I hate to generalize, but I don't think very few people would say it's a totally positive experience because it's such a changing experience. You go in with... Uh, you know, it's like boot camp, but a lot longer. And I think a lot more stressful, at least it was when I was there. Uh, and I'm sure it still is. It changes you. You go in with a certain set of preconceptions and attitudes and uh, knowledge and abilities, and you come out as a different person. Um, you still have the same memories, but you're, I think your character changes. And, you know, it, it's supposed to build character. Yes, uh, it also changes character, and those changes have to be reflected on. It's not something the first year out of the academy you think, well, here's how I changed, and here's how I will be, and I will be this way forever, and I'm not going to change again. Well, guess what? You will change again. Uh, you Like a piece of steel, you're going to, after the stress is gone, you're going to not retain the total bend. You're going to begin straightening again. And some of those straightenings are positive and some possibly negative. So it's a powerful experience and reflecting on it as Dan does, it's kind of a mixed blessing. What What are your feelings about that? I mean, do you di agree or disagree? No, no, I agree. I, you know, it was, uh, the Academy was hard in ways that I did not anticipate. And it was easy in ways that I didn't expect it to be. Right. And some of the, you know, I, I found the academics, particularly some of the, uh, you know, things like electrical engineering, where the, the course material was hard, but the attitudes of the professors was harder. Uh, right? And so there, there were things like that when I look back and I just, you know, I, I, I cringe a bit. And then I also like Lenson, because I think in the last couple of pages of the book, when he's remembering his time as a midshipman and graduating that, you know, he, he's of that ilk, which I was of, I'll be happy to see this place in the rearview mirror, you know, and, and I don't, I don't know that I'll be back here. Right. And then, you know, he comes back as the superintendent. So that's a, that's a life changing um, or a, a viewpoint changing uh, event for him is certainly to come back as the superintendent. Um, I, I wanted to to touch uh, because you brought it up, and I thought the way you uh, the way you wrote it, with, you know, towards the end, uh, he's he has to he and the other superintendents of the of the service academies have to go up and testify before uh, the Senate Armed Services Committee or one of the one of the committees in Congress. Uh, and and basically there there there's lots of pressures to you know downsize or consolidate academies maybe move the naval academy as you pointed up to West Point where they have extra space um, you know and Lenson says well you know I, I disagree for these reasons um, and then you know he he throws out the idea which I thought was uh, a, a very original of well if you if you have to consolidate any you know the coast guard academy the naval academy and the and the merchant marine academy would be ones to consolidate not that he was recommending that but that you know that that would make some sense in that they're all maritime focused right they're all about you know going to sea and and uh, safe navigation and you know ships and you need to be on the waterfront to do that so um but but I was um I was curious how you see, you know, sort of national events, politics playing on the military and how that, you know, kind of led to that scene in your, in your mind? Well, you're, you're confusing me a little bit there, Bill, because are you talking about fictional political events or current political events? Well, 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 the, well, both, you know, how to, how did, how do current political events maybe impact your writing of this, you know, your, your envisioning, because like when I read it, and I read the, you know, the Senate 
Lenson and others, you know, uh, talking on Capitol Hill to some pretty, um, uh, you know, characters, senators who are pretty harsh mm -hmm. about the academies and about the military in general. I was just, you know, curious, how did that kind of come to you, the way it plays out? And then, uh, you know, maybe some of the research or the discussions you had with Admiral Buck or others about, you know, how those those kinds of uh, test of, you know, the, the, the testifying before the Senate mm -hmm. goes. Yeah, I, I, I interviewed a couple of uh, superintendents and of course, uh, of course, did my did my research, uh, you know, and, and read uh, there have been quite a few books published over the years. And I'm talking about over the last century about uh, the mission of the academies and uh, the positive and negative aspects and whether to disestablish them, which is kind of a recurring and never long absent um, question that Congress seems to ask. Uh, you know, they always go back to the, the census as an elitist institution and that uh, it's uh, and um, the, the selection processes that it uses are constantly questioned as they are right now. Uh, I wrote the, the Academy um, uh, over a period of uh, a year, uh, which would be about two years ago now. So there's not a whole lot of, you know, you notice that I don't use real names for the senators. And all right. that, although some of the senators have appeared earlier, both in the Hemlock County books and also in the earlier Lenson books. Uh, forgot where I was going with that sentence, but yes, he's attacked from both the left and the right, and he has to has to think on his feet and address the issues and come up with something that will convince Congress to continue funding the place despite their um, misgivings. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought you, I thought that was uh, was quite accurately done. So, but I but I have not been in the seat. You know, I haven't been somebody who's had to testify uh, and go through that. But uh, it it felt very realistic to me. Sir, so, uh, we're running a little short on time. But one more question, I just want to ask. A lot of our listeners are proceedings and naval history authors. I'm sure some of them are aspiring book authors, even novelists. Uh, any advice for them? You know, what's the hardest part of writing for you? How do you overcome it? What would, what would you tell somebody who maybe is, uh, you know, starting their career as a, a young naval officer and also might, you know, have the have the acorn of a novel in their head? Well, you walked into that one, Bill, because, yes, I, uh, you know, I tried to summarize my, my 16 years of teaching experience. Uh, you know, I had scores of students that I helped a publication. And the uh, I don't know thirty plus years of uh, of novelistic experience, and in July I brought a brought out a book, writing in the age of AI, which uh, summarizes everything I know about writing and tries to awesome. adapt it, tries to adapt it to uh, to the oncoming tsunami of uh, artificially generated content. How do we use that uh, tool, which is a powerful tool? How do I use it? How do we defend ourselves against th uh, theft of our ideas? And uh, what is the marketplace going to look like? So, yeah, I did. I did consider a lot of those things, and you know, rather than try to come out with a couple of a couple of um, you know quick answers as to what to do if you want to become a writer, I just say, look at that book. Uh, you know, writing yeah, hold, in the age of AI. Hold it up again. Hold it up again, if you would. Okay, it's uh, writing in the age of AI. And who published it? Uh, Northampton House Press. Gotcha. Okay. Well, thanks. Now I, I'm I'm curious about that because and and uh, that also ties in with a conversation we've been having here at the Naval Institute with our editorial board, and you know we uh, we do. 12 to 13 essay contests a year, right? We've had our general prize essay contest that dates back to uh, 1879. And Alfred mm -hmm. Thayer Mahan took one of the prizes in the first year that we published, you know, those, those essays. And now we've got a whole bunch of others, the Coast Guard essay contest, the Marine Corps, the enlisted prize, the, um, the emerging and disruptive technology. We, we do a lo lots of essay contests. And this year we had to start one um, on our website, on the portal where people submit their essays, it it we ask for an acknowledgement, a check in the block. I understand that the Naval Institute 
runs plagiarism checkers and that they run an AI checker. So we run, we have to check to see if people are submitting, you know, AI written chat GPT written essays for our essay contests. And I will tell you right now, we're reading 150 of the general prize essays and probably 10 or 15 of them so far of the 85 that I've read have been flagged as uh, some, to some extent, 50% or more uh, written by AI. So we obviously kick those out the door. Um, you know, I think there's, with our, in a conversation with our editorial board, you know, we, we go round and round of this. Is it okay to use AI to generate ideas? Is it okay for somebody to say, you know, I would have been this way as a lieutenant. Um, I might have you. I might have been tempted to say to AI, "Can you give me a an outline for an essay on on this topic to help me get over writer's block?" Right. Mm -hmm. I think that that's okay, um, but I think you know writing whole cloth paragraphs is not okay. Right. Uh, but it, you know, and then as you pointed out, and I know uh, others have. Um, AI is stealing intellectual property. AI is scrubbing and not giving credit to authors, and and, and sometimes it even makes up footnotes, right? So you'll you'll get something back, and you'll have ten footnotes, and you're like, wow, that's impressive. And then you start checking the footnotes, and you go, that's not a real footnote. <laughs> that's not a real. Footnote. There's no there's no such book written by that author. So yeah, I, it's, yeah, it's an interesting time that we're, we're living in. I, I may be able to shed some more light on that if you require you know, advice or whatever. Oh, I'd, I'd love that. I, mm -hmm. that, yeah, that, I would love to, uh, to be in touch with you after this and maybe, maybe pick your brain for some advice on that. Yeah. Um, well, we are unfortunately out of time. This has been a really fun conversation for me. It's, yeah. uh, it's kind of like getting, getting to talk to your hero. Uh, okay. so my guest today, novelist, David Poyer, author of the Dan Lenson series of Navy novels. His latest book in the series is titled the Academy. It'll be out in time for Christmas 2023. Put it on your wish list. David, congrats on another page turner. Uh, and thanks for your time today. Thank you, Bill. All right. Well, this episode is brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield. What makes good vision coverage? I knew it when I saw it. Things like fully covered vision care exams for all members. Access to over 125,000 independent providers and national retailers. That's why I chose Blue Cross Blue Shield FEP Vision. See what we can do for you at bcbsfepvision.com. To see you at Defense Forum Washington on 7 December. And until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.